Thank you, John, and thank you, Kat, and to, to the organisers for inviting me again to a fantastic symposium. It's great to be here. I probably took longer than the New York group to get here because I went down on the 405 and <laughs> yesterday afternoon. It was unbelievable. So <laughs> you probably beat me. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about some work that we're doing in the lab uh, that uh, takes pluripotent stem cells uh, and travels through the hematopoietic, or the mesoderm and the hematopoietic system um, into the T-cell lineage. And first of all, I'd just like to disclose that uh, some of the work that I'm presenting was funded under a sponsored research agreement between UCLA and Kite, and that Gilead Kite has licensed um, the model that I'm going to talk about today. So um, you've heard a beautiful explanation of um, the, the niche in the marrow and how it affects um, hematopoietic stem cell self-renewal. And the interesting thing about the marrow is that the stem cells are taken into every single lineage bar one within this niche. Um, and that single lineage that requires the movement outside of the bone marrow and into the circulation and into this organ called the thymus um, is the T-cell lineage. Um, everything else, other lymphoid lineages and lymphoid commitment occur within the marrow. So studying the thymus itself and the signals that occur in the thymus is essential to understand how to go from a stem cell um, into a T-cell. And my, my lab has been interested for a long time in these progenitors and, and how stem cells, especially human stem cells, um, are regulated um, and, and in this transition into the thymus. So this um, work was uh, really um, inspired by some um, studies done uh, and published now a couple of years ago by two senior members of the lab, Chris Seat, who's an MD, PhD, he did his PhD on this question. Um, and he's now an, a junior faculty uh, in adult Hemonc. And Amelie Montel Hagen, who is a project scientist in the lab and has a, an extensive experience in hematopoiesis. So before I go on, for all the non-hematopoietic people and non-thymus people, I'm going to give you a, a quick run through of the various flow cytometry panels that you're about to see. So as I mentioned, you start off in the bone marrow, and the progenitors and the stem cells in the marrow are, CD30, are marked by CD34 in humans. They then enter the circulation, still as CD34, and they start off in the thymus as what we call as double negatives. And by that I mean they express neither the marker CD8 nor the marker CD4. These are key T cell differentiation markers. And they start off also as CD34, so they retain that marker, which in the human system actually is a great advantage because we can uh, dissect out the, the population of 34s further. The next phase, um, in general, that they, they become in the human, again, it's different to the mouse, is the immature single positive four. And by that, mean, I mean they have four and not eight. And they're immature because they're not yet expressing the TCR or the CD3 component of the TCR. Then they become these double positives, and these dominate the thymus. They're 95% of all the thymic t uh, precursors and T cells. And by that, of course, I mean that they have both CD4 and CD8. And some of them are now starting to turn on this surface CD3. And these are the, the later um, versions of the d double positive. And at this point, they go through positive selection in the thymus. And th they, in positive selection, leads to either CD8s or s single positive 8s, um, in which they uh, also express CD3. And they have been positively selected on the class 1 MHC. Or they are ex selected on class 2, and they become single positives. So that's the sort of pattern that I'll be showing you in terms of um, thymic development. The other important thing to mention here is this critical moment here where they really um, commit to being T cells um, out of this earlier stage is notch dependent. And so anything, so without notch, you can't get to this very first stage. And so that led to this um, model that Chris and Amelie created, uh, which we call an artificial thymic organoid, or ATO. And it's a simple model, actually, where we take 
CD34 positive cells or HSCs, and they can come from either the cord blood, the bone marrow, or the mobilized peripheral blood, these three key um, sources of transplantation for humans. And we just uh, isolate them um, by fax so that they've got rid of all the T cells. And we take a murine stromal line called MS5, which has been transduced to express notch ligand, so either delta-1 or now more commonly delta-4 is what we study. And this is a, a monolayer culture which is trypsinized up and, and the two components are centrifuged together to make a cell pellet which is then put on a membrane, a porous membrane, and it's grown in, um, this aggregate is grown in uh, serum-free media with some components here. And that's what it looks like in a little... Um, 30 millimeter dish. They survive and expand for at least 12 weeks if they're started off with these um, sources of stem cells. And they absolutely have to have this component of a notch ligand. They have to have a stroma that can grow serum free, which is the MS5. And they have to be 3D. And we've done the sort of crossover experiments. If you take out any of those components, it doesn't work. Um, and just to re um, recap very quickly what they've uh, published was that if you look at this system, which we call, in this case, it's ATOs with delta-1 in 3D versus the standard system that's been used for many years um, called OP9 delta-1, and this is a monolayer, you can, the big difference that you see is not in T-cell commitment because they've both got notch ligands. You can see these markers CD5 and 7, which, which herald T-cell commitment, are, are very similar. But in the production of these double positives and then single positives, so positive selection, in the monolayer system you get a few, some double positives, but um, really not great um, positive selection. And then also in the, in the upregulation of these the TCR and CD3, um, and to some extent you can see uh, gamma deltas. And so if you gate on these, um, t uh, the TCR, you can see really nice positive selection. Um, these cells coming out of the ATO, in this case the CD8s, are highly diverse, shown by VA uh, alpha and V beta sequencing, and very to a similar extent in the thymus and the peripheral blood CD8s. And this is just some uh, quantitative data showing that the big change in the ATO is in these later section, later um, uh, linea um, maturation. So this led us, the fact that we actually developed this as just a model system to, to look at T-cell potential and was surprised at how well it was uh, making mature T-cells, which immediately led us to think, well, could this be used for adoptive T-cell therapy to create them out of stem cells as opposed to peripheral blood? So the current uh, strategies that have been extremely uh, successful to date um, in, uh, in using CAR T-cells, and I'm sure you've all heard about, is that um, autologous T cells are taken from the blood and viral vectors are used to express a TCR or a CAR um, and, and polyclonal T cells with a multiple range of T cell receptors, other T cell receptors are expanded. And the advantage to this is the patient gets their own cells back, so they're perfectly HLA matched. But the limitations is that there's a, there, the supply depends entirely on the patient's own T cells um, that the, the, um, the coordination can be very difficult with a patient who's ill with leukemia and lymphoma to get uh, the product. Um, and therefore, because it's a patient-specific product that is not self-renewing, it has to be harvested each time um, and, and transduced, is the cost is very high with vectors and, and phoresis and cell manufacturing. There's also a theoretical potential that you, or not more than theoretical, that you could induce functional alterations in the T cells that you're uh, taking out. So they're already mature, and then you've got putting them through a, a lot of uh, ex vivo expansion and so on. And theoretically, you might also mispair the TCRs or the CARs that you're putting in with the ones that are already expressed on these mature T cells. So that would be call, calling mispairing and theoretically might change their antigen-specific reactivity and even cause autoimmunity. And then the other thing is that these are inconsistent products at harvest. So some of them work beautifully, some patients, um, and others do not. And it seems to be something that's really intrinsic to the, T to the patient themselves. Um, they've, and, and that has an, 
has a, co a strong correlation with how well they work to control the leukemia. So the alternatives that have been looked at um, in this field is uh, to autologous cells um, are these universal off-the-shelf T cells. And this might, allow, this might require and allow gene editing um, if they're allogeneic, meaning not patient um, sourced and therefore not matched, um, or stem cell derived using either hematopoietic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells. The, the system that I just showed you was a, what we might call an HPC system, a hematopoietic progenitor cell system, and that is great. It works well in the model, but this would um, have quite a lot of problems with converting to a clinical product in that you would have limited numbers of these stem progenitor cells from a single donor, um, even a healthy donor. Um, they would be allogeneic, so they would need they would be expressing potentially allo-reactive T cells that would cause graft versus host disease, or they'd be inc and they'd be incompatible, so they might get rejected. Um, and also, the stem cells are not self-renewing in culture, so you really would require um, gene editing or some sort of manip manipulation. And it's very possible with these cells, but it's never perfect. Most escape that. So this leads um, our group and others to consider pluripotent stem cells as a source of these T cells because they're self-renewing. If you used induced P, uh, uh, IPS from a patient, there would be a limitless source, although I think that this is less feasible. Um, and then just because of cost and time. Um, but pluripotent stem cells can be easily and stably genetically modified to create uh, universal or near universal donors by modifying MHC or modifying the bleeding T, uh, the TCR. So other groups have tried this. So um, uh, Gordon Keller's group and Marianne Kennedy reported that they could make um, some T cell um, precursors from um, pluripotent stem cells, as have others. People have taken T cells, mature T cells, and could reprogram them into IPS. So these are called TIPSIs. Um, and they can be, in turn, taken into a T cell precursor. And others, including Dan Kaufman here, of course, have, taken car, uh, have put CARs into pluripotent stem cells. But these are largely making innate cells, rather the innate uh, T cells rather than the mature conventional T cells. And all of these groups have to some extent um, used this uh, OP9 Delta 1 monolayer that I mentioned earlier is this, has been the standard way of making T cells. And so they really get stuck at the, at the double positive or even earlier stage. So the logical thing that we did was to generate T cells um, from it, using our system. And what we do here is we use three to four days of mesoderm induction, which we've published before. In the paper that we've recently published, we sort out the um, what we call EMPs, um, embryonic mesoderm progenitors, um, and we use delta four mm. predominantly in this system. And then we take the cell, we take the cells, and we create the ATOs at this point. We put the uh, mesoderm progenitors directly into aggregates with the stroma. Um, we change the media for the next couple of weeks in, uh, to a hematopoietic medium, and then we take it through the T-cell medium. So the aggregates remain undist undisrupted during this period. It's simply a change in medium. So first of all, we focused on what's happening at this early stage in hematopoietic induction. And this is a flow cytometry um, using a sort of Tisney-like plot, which is a UMAP um, display. And essentially what it shows is that in this hematopoietic induction, you have the CD34s coming up. So you're starting with a mesoderm progenitor that is not a CD30, is not committed to hematopoiesis. But pretty rapidly, um, CD34s, endothelium, and hematopoietic start to come up in this system, as you can see. And then you s it, this switch to T-cell differentiation, this is just showing the first se t uh, seven days, you you're getting a persistence of the hematopoietic cells. So then focusing on this period of T-cell differentiation within the cultures, and this is now looking at weeks, um, this is all with the H1 system, and it's unmanipulated. And you can see that CD45, which is a hematopoietic marker, starts to come up pretty rapidly, and then within uh, three weeks, it's the dominant cell type within these cultures. And then these markers here, again, which herald 
T cell commitment come up and are really um, the dominant cell within these cultures are T cell precursors. Um, and then looking within those set five, seven positive cells, you see a, a progression actually faster than you do from cord blood into a double positive stage and then ultimately um, dominated actually by CD8 positive cells. There are some CD4 positive cells, but not um, as many as the CD8s. And then if you look further at maturation markers, you can see CD3 and TCR coming up by week three and then dominating within the culture. So um, the, uh, now looking further at the, f at the phenotype with all these flow cytometry panels, um, the important ones here to look at is that the CD8 positive cells, these are gated on CD8 positives, are um, alpha and beta, the heterodimers of CD8, and that's important because that shows you that they're a conventional T cell. Um, the CD8 alpha alphas that don't have beta are the more innate like cells that are produced in the OP9 system. They're mature naive, shown by this marker. They express um, other markers of mature naive cells like CD27, 28, uh, to some extent CCR7 and um, L-selectin or CD62 ligand. And then this is a um, immunoseq, um, high throughput sequencing of the TCRs and, what, and it's comparing the CD8s that are coming out of the pluripotent stem cell system to normal thymus, um, the V-beta diversity. And you can see that they're very similar diversity, the gray and the black. This is a, a, a section through the ATOs, and it's, it's essentially it's just showing you that the, the MS5, a stroma, is remaining in there, and it's marked by GFP. This is the MS5 that's carrying the notch ligand, and you can see a nice expression of CD3 um, within the system, CD3 being a marker of the T-cell receptor. This works on um, five lines that we've tried. Um, th here are two UCLA-generated lines by our core. They're NIH-approved. And again, they're comparing thymus with the output from the, the, um, the uh, uh, ATO. And they're very similar levels of TCR diversity and similar types of patterns of um, differentiation. Here is a commercial line called ESI-17, which is um, a GMP compliant, and similarly, it goes through a nice maturation. And then th this is an IPS line that was fibroblast derived, so it's not a TIPSI, and, it's a, and again, it, w it works in this line. So the ideal gen um, engineer T cell, if one thinks about it, um, because these are just uh, making a lot of diverse TCRs and it's, they're not targeting anything in particular, the ideal um, T cell that one would produce would proliferate and kill in an antigen-specific manner. It would be able to expand robustly, survive and home to tumor cells, and be non-reactive uh, non to alloantigens so that you could use it as more of a universal product. So you wouldn't want TCRs against the host and you would want it to be HLA compatible in some way. Um, so we went, then went and did something similar to what we had done with the cord blood ATO. We used a lentivirus that is expressing a specific TCR that's well known. It's HLA restricted to AO201, and it, it targets the um, tumor antigen NYESO. And this lentivirus also carries the fluorescent marker BFP. We made the, an ES line, uh, we sorted it and, and expanded it so it was all BFP positive, but it's not from a clone, this one. And then we made EMPs um, with mesoderm uh, um, differentiation, uh, made the cell pellet and carried it through exactly the same system as the ATO. And what we found here was that um, even faster um, development of T cell development, uh, T cell maturation was shown. We're expressing the TCR and the CD3 um, in all of the cells because this is a lentiviral vector. But importantly, you can see that that TCR is carrying the specific V beta that is, um, sorry, the, the T cells are expressing the specific V beta uh, TCR, that is on the, our TCR that we transduced, the 13.1. So that's the one on the NYESO TCR, and all of the cells are expressing this. And that does not change um, uh, differentiation anyway, other than to make it a little faster. 
Um, so in, in the end, the, the majority of cells that we have are these cytotoxic T lymphocytes that are CD8. Um, and again, they show a conventional phenotype, so they've not converted into an innate-like cell that would sit here. They have both alpha and beta. They're mature, naive cells that, again, express these important markers. And uh, fascinatingly, they uh, appear to induce, this expression of a single TCR appears to induce allelic exclusion. So this is a normal phenomenon that occurs in T cell development because you don't want multiple, you don't want to keep rearranging your TCRs once you have uh, the right TCR on your surface. Every T cell should have a single uh, TCR that is unique. Uh, from its clone anyway, or unique to its clone. And so what you need to be able to do, and there's a, there is a mechanism for this, is repress the endogenous TCRs once you've made your own. So by taking this TCR um, expressing precursor through from a stem cell, we're inducing the same mechanism. So only the, the only uh, cells that are produced um, uh, have this TCR. And we've shown that in uh, the cord blood system as well. These cells, importantly, are functional. So you can take out the CD8 positive cells and you can stimulate them either with a specific antigen that the, for the TCR that they're carrying, that's the NYESO, or an irrelevant antigen. In this case, this would be the MART1 um, antigen. And so we put these antigens into a, an artificial antigen presenting cells and, seen, and, and cultured them with the CD8s that we have produced in our system. And these are markers of activation or, or cytokine release, I should say. And you can see that it's pretty specific to, those, um, to, to the NYESO that they're getting upregulated. Um, in 24 hours, you can see activation markers CD25 and CD41 and BB only with the relevant antigen and not with the, um, barely with the irrelevant. And after five days, you see a nice proliferation shown by this membrane staining and again activation. Um, and in, interestingly, what has happened to the phenotype at this point is that it's gone from um, an immature cell, um, sorry, an immature cell down here, and with activation with the antigen, it's become an effector memory um, phenotype, as you can see. Um, at this point, the, the cells can expand. This is about 100-fold. We're actually getting more like 300-fold now with better systems. Um, they kill in vitro, uh, specifically to the NYESO, and not to the BART1 irrelevant antigen. And in, vi in vivo, we're seeing control, but not complete eradication with these cells. Um, the, we've done RNA-seq, and what you can see, and we're comparing here ES cells, undifferentiated, to the mesoderm progenitors, to the single positive eights that have been um, isolated. And not surprisingly, you go through a nice pluripotent pattern down below, um, and then through mesoderm and EMT, and then ultimately the turning on of all of these key T cell antigens. Um, we were interested to know how similar is this T cell to a normal T cell, a normal T cell coming out of a thymus or out of peripheral blood using this RNA-seq. And here we're comparing the two phenotypes, the double positive, which is the precursor phenotype, to the 8SP. And we're comparing them out of thymus and cord blood ATOs, the, the original ATOs, and pluripotent stem cell ATOs. And you can certainly see that they are clustering together immunophenotypically, but there are differences with the cord blood ATO being sort of an intermediate stage. So we're interested to know what are these differences uh, depending on the source. Oh, and the other thing to mention is that all of the pluripotent stem cell ones cluster very, very strongly together. There's essentially no difference in them transcriptionally, whether they're an untransduced uh, H1 ES um, derived or TCR transduced or from an IPS. So if you look at um, some of these, uh, this is comparing cord blood in um, blue, I believe, yep, cord blood ATOs with the pluripotent stem uh, ATOs in red. And it's comparing how the fold, as the, the fold difference in genes of certain categories between the double positive and the eight single positive stage. And what we see is that in the important sort of T cell specific areas, there's no difference between the cord blood and the pluripotent um, derived. 
meaning that f such uh, areas as sort of lymphocyte um, uh, and cytokine production and cell migration. So the differences in cell cycle, um, and we see this over and over, that there are subtle differences in cell cycle in cultured cells coming out of even uh, pluripotent versus cord blood and certainly in primary cells. So we then looked at cell cycling data in from thymus, uh, cord blood ATOs, and pluripotent ATOs. And the, the, they have the, the right pattern in terms of comparing double positives to single positives. So most of the cycling is occurring here in the, in the double positives in all of these systems as it should. And the, and the difference is that the single eights, which tend to have shut down their cell cycling, have a few, um, have, have some increase in cell cycling compared to the endogenous. If you look um, at the transcriptional differences between single fours and single eights, they hold true depending, uh, d irrelevant to um, their source. So pluripotent ATOs versus normal thymus, it's an identical pattern. So they're not getting confused in terms of their, their positive selection. And then finally, we took um, a known database of genes, um, groups that uh, define a naive T cell versus something else, an NK cell, for example. And we had very good clustering, uh, whether you were from a normal thymus, a cord blood ATO, a pluripotent ATO, which had been transduced or not transduced. They're all expressing these naive conventional T cell mark, um, transcription. And then finally, just an interesting, we, this has been alluded to in the first two talks, um, especially um, Sally's talk, is this fetal d uh, differences, differences between um, fetal-derived cells and adult-derived cells. So in the hematopoietic system, there are waves of differentiation or waves of um, hematopoiesis that occur during, um, em sorry, during the embryonic stage and uh, beyond. So the first stage is called the primitive or, or first stage of hematopoiesis. And this is not giving rise to true hematopoietic stem cells, but to some progenitors that keep uh, the system alive. The second phase is also mostly um, myeloid and erythroid progenitors. And the third phase, which is called definitive hematopoiesis, and this is the one where the T cells really not come from in a normal system, the thymus develops at this week 10, and these um, definitive hematopoietic stem cells are arising from the AGM and then moving to the fetal liver, and then ultimately ending up in marrow um, by the time a human is born. So these are these waves um, that exist. And we noted in our um, immunoseq data, when we compared it with thymus, normal th um, postnatal thymus and peripheral blood, the, the length of the CDR3, so this is a, the segment of the TCR, uh, the part of the variable segment that is, um, uh, adds diversity to a TCR. Um, and if you look at the, the CDR3 length coming from out of the pluripotent ATOs, it's considerably significantly uh, shorter overall than, than the CDR3 lengths of these adult T cells. And we therefore looked at TDT expression because this is the enzyme that adds the N nucleotides to the TCR and to extend the length of the CDR3. And indeed, um, the, air, the, the cell type that should express TDT here and uh, to some extent here, it's, the TDT expression is only in these um, postnatal um, origins, either a cord blood ATO or a postnatal thymus, whereas a fetal thymus or a pluripotent stem cell does not have this enzyme. And it's just, it's, it's a, it does not appear to be affecting the function of our cells at all. It may actually have some theoretical advantages for other reasons. But it does show that even though you've taken a cell through weeks and weeks of culture in an identical uh, microenvironment, this ATO, it nonetheless has retained a memory of this specific enzyme in this particular case, which is fascinating. It has not altered that. So this epigenetic memory has held true. 
So to summarize, um, the, the pluripotent derived T cells generated in the system make a mature naive phenotype and a, a broad V-beta repertoire with polyfunctional production of cytokines and proliferation to activation. Um, it's been reproducible in at least five lines. We've not found a line yet that we, it doesn't work, although I'm sure that there are some that it won't work as well. Um, the NYSO TCR cells generated engineered mature functional cells that um, showed allelic exclusion and antigen specific cytotoxicity and transcriptional analysis confirmed that they're both conventional and naive despite this fetal memory. So the phase that we are in now is to gene edit the ES cells to overcome outer reactivity and, um, and the need for antiviral vectors. And finally, uh, to th thank my fantastic lab, and particularly Amelie, Chris, and David Casero that led this project. Our collaborators, a wonderful cause, and a, a terrific funding um, partners, especially CERM. Thank you. Guys, oh, Clive, guys. Uh, great talk. Uh, do you want to comment, it's from Paul's talk as well, about the age of the T cell? Because an old T cell from the niche might not be as good as a young T cell that just comes out of a, a IPS or a fetal tissue. So is there going to be an effect of that to it help CAR T? Yes, and that's, that's uh, it could either be a positive or a negative, and we don't know yet. Um, when we look functionally at the T cells, um, they're behaving in terms of cytotoxicity assays, for example, and expansion, they're behaving at least as well as a peripheral blood T cell. So that would be an old T cell, I guess. Um, but they do have this slight difference, you know, in transcription because they are uh, cycling. And what we need to do and haven't done yet is look at their telomere lengths. Um, in terms of survival in vivo, the in vivo models are very imperfect um, and it really is not possible for us to, as yet, make that comparison in vivo. Hi, Gay. Uh, this is a fantastic talk and uh, I think the ATO model really has been a, a big leap forward in, in being able to differentiate functional uh, CD8 T cells, but w can you comment on the scalability of this using the organoid system versus monolayer systems or, or, yeah. or feeder-free systems? Yeah. We think it's actually very scalable. And the reason is, so let me give you some numbers. So pluripotent cells in general don't produce as many T cells on a per cell basis as does cord blood, for example. So just working on the pluripotent system, which I think is the most obvious to go clinical, um, 50 ATOs um, produce about 500,000 uh, T cells, which doesn't sound a lot. But 50 ATOs is trivial in terms of just an, an, a manual production. Um, so we routinely, for a sing single experiment, play at 300, for example. Um, so one would have to do, let's say, 500 to get to about 5 million T cells, which is still not enough. But then, you can, then when they expand, there's a hundredfold expansion, and those are the ones we're doing the functional assays on. So now you're really getting into a clinical... Uh, a number of cells. How many of these cells compared to a normal peripheral blood product would be required? I don't know. But people in, in the clinic are use, for the adoptive therapy are using somewhere between 5 million and 50 million T cells per kilo. So we're in that range um, and I think it's very easy to automate. The cells just fall out. You don't have to use digestion and so on. They, they fall out very readily. Thanks again.